All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Shelby. Uh, she started with me as a master student in uh, in the fall, and I actually met her at a region at a meeting, regional meeting, and got interested in toxicology and working with frogs and salamanders. And uh, we were kind of working on what we work on. So we got a. Can I minimize the camera? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry. There's this there we go. Uh, and uh, she was interested in, she got interested in sodium selenate and uh, sodium chloride and working with Ambistema. And just to let you know, I think since like January 13th when salamanders started breeding, she's been in every day getting experiments going. We have some experimental data she's showing today that was finished on Thursday, I think, of last, no Friday of last week. So uh, anyway, I'll let Shelby tell her about what she's been working on. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about the comparison of Xenopus labus and Ambistopa maculatum embryos in determining the developmental toxicity of sodium fluoride and sodium selenate. Okay, so probably one half of frog species and one third of salamander species need ephemeral wetlands to reproduce. And due to them having a very sensitive larval stage, they're, um, they're vulnerable to toxins that can be in their environment. So one of the biggest concerns that we have as scientists is determining the different chemicals or pollutants that could be in their environment. So in this experiment, we have two different test subjects. We have the Xenopus labus, which is also called the African clawed frog, and Ambestum immaculatum, which is our spotted salamanders. The Xenopus are a non-native species. They are from Africa and are NATO species uh, that we actually caught those guys from Henry Farm Park. And you can tell with our picture here of the labus that they have these little claws, not technically claws, but they're at the ends of their hind legs here. And then another way to uh, classify the Ambistema is their lovely spots all over their back. The chemicals that I'm working with is sodium fluoride and sodium selenate. Sodium fluoride, as we all know, it's in our water. We use it to, um, for fluoridation of our drinking water. However, we can find it in the production of aluminum production of bricks that we use and in the fertilizers that we use in the area. It is a very well-known pollutant in our area and some malformations that we found in literature that we use is the head length measurements, how they got stunted in growth. And then sodium selenate, it's actually rare to find it in its elemental form in, the, in nature. However, we can find it with the production of petroleum and like discharge from petroleum and metal refineries and corrosion and natural deposits and discharge from mines. It can exist in nature inorganic and organically. And there is a narrow range between the deficiency and toxicity. So you can have a little bit of it or too much of it, and it can still have an effect. And then we also have it in our pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, and fertilizers. So the objective or the hypothesis of this experiment is to see if Xenopus make an acceptable model for estimating the developmental effects of chemicals on native amphibians, including the Ambistimus species. This will be determined by the following objectives. So we have LC50, EC50, and MCIG. LC50 determines the 50% of water mortality occurs. EC50 determines where 50% of malformation occurs. MCIG is the minimum concentration in inhibition growth. So determining how small or how large these guys are. We also have material methods. There are some consistencies and some difference between the species. Some consistencies, we have to double sort the eggs. So 
any cluster or any <coughs> eggs that we use, we sort them once, go back, and we sort them again. Make sure we use really good eggs. And then we have to make sure those eggs are in a flashula or an early gashula stage, or else they will not be good to use during the experiment. Once we have them um, sorted, we put them in a VTEC solution. They go in an incubator at 22.4 uh, Celsius, and they'll stay in that throughout the experiment. At the end of each experiment, we will check for the malformations, mortality, and the length measurements. Throughout the experiment, we will check mortality every day. And then whenever it comes to taking pictures of the um, specimens, we use MS-222 to stun them or paralyze them so they don't move around in the dishes. So for the Xenopus labus material methods, just um, clarify what these pictures are. We have an egg that just divided twice, so we can see clear as day that there's four divisions or four separate parts. And then this is a little bit, I think it's about 24, 48 hours development. They look like the little bacteria to me, like little distinct bacteria. And then we have these guys who are about 48 hours to 72 hours, and they just look like little sucker heads to me. <laughs> So the thing about these Xenopus is they are captive bred. We keep them in Martin Paul, uh, across from Dr. Avery's office. And then we have to inject them with a hormone in order to get them going to anaphylaxis, which is getting them to mate with each other. And then that takes about 12 hours. And after 12 hours, we collect them. And we'll put the eggs in a Blast and we'll L-cysteine them, which gets that jelly coating off of those eggs. Makes it a lot easier for sorting. And then once we put them in their Petri dishes, we use about 20 embryos into these small, shallow Petri dishes. And then the test will take about 96 hours. So it starts on a Monday and ends on a Friday. So you're checking those every day. It just usually takes about two hours. It's always fun. And then we have the Invistima maculata material methods. So we have what the eggs look like on day one. After about a day or so, we get the neuralizing. In my words, they look like little clams. Then they come up here about day two, day three, look like tiny little manatees to me. As you know, I get my own names. And then they start to form like an actual body. You can start seeing where their gills are going to start forming. This whole process takes about 12 days for them to get completely developed as a larva. So we collect them at Henry Farm Park. And we, instead of using the shallow dishes, we use large deep dishes because their embryos are a lot larger than the Xenopus. <laughs> And instead of using 20, we use about 10 embryos per dish. Test lasts about 12 days. In order to help me with not having to kill myself for three hours every day, we only change solutions every other day. And this is just what they look like as egg masses. We collect about seven to 14 egg masses every time because we need to make sure we collect enough eggs. And then this is, this is the site at Henry Farm Park. It's a wetland behind the softball fields. It's lovely this time of year. <laughs> and then results. So this data is for the Xenopus labus, for the sodium chloride, their growth, uh, sorry, concentration and response. We took the data from two tests and we combined them because they were pretty similar. As you can see, about I'm going to say, what is that, 750, 1,000? We saw complete death. Everybody died. No one survived. And then about 500, that's when we hit our EC54 malformations. And then for the Invista maculatum for the fluoride, we kind of saw the same thing. We definitely saw the death happening. But the malformations didn't really occur that much. I do believe that's because of their jelly coating, but we'll get to that later. 
for the sodium selenate that came to the Xenophys, we had two tests that I did, and <clears throat> test one, they died. They did not like it. But we did see some malformations occur. It didn't take much <laughs> compared to fluoride. These guys only needed about 10 to 100 um, milligrams per liter of sodium selenate to die. But then when we did the second test, we changed a couple things. Instead of our highest concentration, 100, we dropped it to the highest concentration being 10, and we only used 10 embryos instead of 20. So the density and the petri dishes could have had a different result compared to T1. That's why we had no death in T2 and very little malformation. We have two more minutes. Okay. Sodium selenate, we saw we saw death happen, we saw the malformations occur, but malformations seemed to occur more often in the abysma because they were able to survive longer. With the table, we unfortunately, because this is very preliminary data, very new, there's not much to go on. But we can say the fluorides, they're about that 400 to 600 range in both of them. Types of malformations, so we had loose gut, the edemas, which was just swelling with liquid underneath their skin. Uh, bent notochord or bent spine. <clears throat> and then preliminary summary results, fluoride showed a lot more mortality than the selenate did. However, selenate showed to be more toxic than fluoride did. And xenopus embryos were more affected by selenate than embistoma embryos were. So conclusion, embistoma, Eggs are bigger, easier to see. However, there's no um, methods. We had to create our own methods. Xenopus, great standard model, had great me uh, material methods to it, but the eggs are so tiny, it's so hard to see them. Sensitive, we're still working on that. Because this is very preliminary data, we have no idea how they're actually affected, so we're still working on multiple tests. Jelly coat. We were able to remove it with the Xenopus, but with the Embistema, they have to keep that jelly coat or else they'll die. They need that extra layer of protection or else they will end up dying and withering into nothingness. Mm -hmm. And then thank you, for, I wanted to thank the uh, biology department and Dr. Rayburn. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We have We have time for one question. I'm happy no questions. <laughs> no, I think there is one. Yes. Do you know if there's any um, elevated sodium contamination in that pond that can be found there? I'm not totally sure. We did a pH test, which was 6.6, .6, I believe, but we didn't really test it for any other chemicals in it. All right. Let's thank our speaker again.